continue talking about Tito Mboeni's made and budget statement that was made to Parliament earlier on this afternoon, dividing opinions, some people suggesting that it was a, a no-news budget, if you know what I mean, no big changes and sort of neutral, and some people suggesting that he may well have had his eye on the rating agencies. Let's get other sides of the economy that are impacted by this, the labor side as well as the business side. So in the studio with me, I have uh, Hesho Jawitz, he's the CEO of Jawitz Properties. Thank you for coming through, Thank sir. Matt Simodise, she's vice chairperson, Simodisa. And we also have Krista van Rensberg. He's the head of the Department of Organizational Development at the Association of Mine Workers and Construction Union. Thank you. That's where I begin. Good. From a union side. Yes. Are you jumping up and down? Not at all. Tell me not why not. Very uninspiring budget. We know it's election year. As you were saying, it, we believe it's a ratings agency budget as well. A safe budget, trying to be very safe. We would have liked to see more progressive things in the budget, which wasn't there. What was missing for you? The biggest thing for us, obviously, is the issue of employment, the issue of the structure of the economy. We believe since 94, our ANC government has failed to, to transform the economy. They inherited an, an ex extractive economy focused on commodities, and they just continued eating from the same trough. In your view, did the minister favor business over workers? Well, it's hard to say. As I said, it was a safe budget. So we feel, yes, no, as normal, the, the, the leaning was towards investors, towards business, even though we must concede that business must flourish for us to have work. Okay. So we understand that part, yeah. but we would have liked to see more. Yeah. The issue is growth. Our growth is low. Uh -huh. And the reason for that yeah. is the elephant in the room. Which is? The economy. The economy is stupid. The structure of the economy right. is wrong. All right. Mati, come in. Your initial thoughts. My initial thoughts are, well, I suppose it was a very difficult budget to deliver, given the, why current, why would it be given difficult? the current economic environment that we have. Um, I liked the fact that he was quite clear on there has to be some reforms in our ability to grow the economy, um, fixing our state-owned entities. You can't keep on going. Please we say, can I have some more? Correct. You can't <laughs> keep saying that. But then in terms of the voice of the small businesses in our country, the budget speech did not blow or shoot the lights out for us. Um, given the fact that this is an area which is set to be a lever of economic growth, um, and in fact, if they want to collect more taxes, they need to nurture more businesses to thrive. Yeah. In, in, in essence, then they'll be able to collect more taxes. Yeah. Um, what was also interesting is that they didn't necessarily uh, reduce or increase the corporate tax, which I suppose is a good thing because we're quite okay with where it is now. Right. And if there had to be an increase, that would be not a great thing. Yeah. And then I suppose also the on the horizon is the rise of fuel um, prices, which would then uh, contribute towards the input, uh, well, costs for production. Yeah. Uh, it's never really mm -hmm. a good thing. And then emphasis on the fourth industrial revolution, yeah. um, talking about focus on educating. And I think technology digitization is a very key area. And we've been quite concerned that South Africa is not jumping onto this fourth industrial revolution. So yeah. having mentioned that, it tends to be a good thing. It's so possible. we had Mike Brown, the CEO of uh, NetBank, earlier on on the program, and he was talking about the fact that what he found disappointing was that there weren't many growth uh, policies when there is so much more that he said the minister could have done. Is that a sense that you share? That's definitely the sense that we share. Um, it's a function of, well, one of the things that he did mention around small businesses is giving more money to the Small Enterprise Development Agency. Uh -huh. And in my opinion, it's throwing a good money after bad. Yeah. They have not necessarily been able to nurture high growth, high impact entrepreneurship in our country. Yeah. Um, so for us, it's, well, obviously there are other areas of the entrepreneurship ecosystem that they could do a little bit more on yeah. and what are those interventions and Absolutely. also um, it's important that whatever it's put in place it's either we look at it and say it's not working or it's working yeah. and that's why i say we have been throwing ba good money after bad Absolutely. on a lot of these um you know well he did programs. say that he wasn't going to throw any more money into the hole that is escom <laughs> we're going to talk <laughs> a little bit about that Esha, your initial initial thoughts my initial thoughts are that sometimes a, a safe budget is, is a is a good budget. So you know what I took out of it is just how little room we have to manoeuvre, how little money there is to to go around. So if you look at where the the fiscus is going to increase revenue, it's it's by number one fixing SARS, and two eking out another twelve billion rand from cash-strapped consumers who, who are going to pay 
probably more personal income tax through bracket creep because there'd yeah. be no adjustments to the I'm brackets. I'm surprised he didn't mention it because I was waiting for him to mention mm. the fact that the minister did not agree address the issue of bracket creep. Yeah. Adjusting mm -hmm. for inflation in yeah. a country where we know, yeah, inflation is under control, but it does yeah. make a difference. Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. you know, that, that those adjustments to those brackets uh, has got smaller and smaller and smaller. And over the years. Over the years. And, and this year, other than the, the, the initial threshold, there, there's absolutely no adjustments. There's an increase less than last year, but of 30% to the, the, the fuel levy. Yeah. So I, I think that there's very little money to go around. And I think that, you know, before we can even start thinking about growing the economy, I, I think the government has to fix its house. It has to, so if you look at, if, if you look at reducing the public sector wage bill, which is gonna free up 17 or 18 billion rand over three years, if you mm. look at increased tax collection through the illicit cigarette trade and through big companies and tax evasion, yeah. I think the message is we've first gotta fix our house before yeah. we can start to think about growth because we've got no money. Yeah. So uh, I, I think that, you know, from a, a business point of view and certainly from a, a residential properties uh, point of view, business confidence is low, consumer confidence is low. And, yeah. if, and if the government can spark itself into action yeah. and start delivering on these promises, it will spark business investment. Yeah. It will start to, to increase consumer confidence. And that in itself yeah. will start to positively impact on the economy. I'm getting the sense that you are looking for areas where the government could potentially have helped the increasing uh, increase uh, 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 spending, so, so, so money that stays with the consumer, and you're not to find you're not finding too many areas where that is the case. Correct. So you know the one point that they 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 noted is the revenue collection was down because of an increase in VAT refunds. We know there was that whole commission where in fact SARS I think was bloating its revenue collection by withholding yeah. VAT refunds. Yeah. So you know it seems to be one of the few areas where, where the government is is able to actually put more money back into the, the, the hands of, of consumers. But I, I think that if business and consumers start just feeling better yeah. about what the government is doing to fix itself, yeah. they will respond positively with more investment yeah. and more spending, and that in itself will start to, to deliver some momentum into the economy. Yeah, I wanted to come back and talk a little bit about uh, whose budget this was, and in terms of also the presentation, you don't get the sense that this was a budget that was presented by a former Minister of Labor, um, looking at you, <laughs> um, <laughs> and try to understand who he was aiming the budget at. But in the meantime, let's get in the voice of uh, the uh, Banking Association of South Africa. We earlier caught up with Kas Kuvadia, uh, from the Managing Director. She spoke to Fifi Peters, our reporter, that was outside Parliament. I'm happy about the budget. Under the circumstances, I'm happy, I think, to put conditions for the utilization of funds for SOE. The minister also laid the door open for equity contribution as and when necessary. Uh, uh, and, and I think that what we now need to do is we need to make public the details of the presidential task team's re recommendations. We need to make public the details of how we want to break ESCOM up into three and how we're going to structure that and link the funding directly to that and be transparent about it. Over, other than that, I think there was increases in, in, in spending for social services. I, I think that, that uh, education again and some of the fundamental issues we need to do was addressed. The public sector compensation, I think, absolutely clear that we need to do something about it. There's, there's a, a phased approach towards that. We don't have too much choice in raising income, so we've got to look at expenditure. And I think he's doing that in a responsible way. And he started by saying his job is not politics, his job is to manage the finances of the country. So I think he's, under difficult circumstances, he's done a good job. Do you think he did a good enough job to avert a ratings downgrade by Moody? Well, I, I think that's the point. I think that if we're saying 23 billion rand a year linked to restructuring, we've got to go into the detail and we've got to show how we're going to do that. We've got to show that the 23 billion is not going to go into the existing structure. And I think the rating agencies will look for that sort of detail and they'll appreciate that we do need to plow some money into restructure ESCOM, but not some money into the hole that is there at the moment. But I'm sure as a South African business, we need to appreciate the concerns of ratings agencies being escalating debt levels. And this is exactly what this budget has demonstrated. So I just want to ask from your point of view as the Banking Association, are you prepared for a possible ratings 
ratings downgrade from Moody's? Look, we, we would, I think what we would do is we would urge Moody's to say that this was a budget under very difficult circumstances. We would urge Moody's to actually insist on transparency, detail, and how we, in the medium term, going to manage that debt down. But in the current context, uh, Moody's has been more than generous, I think. In the current context, we would urge Moody's to look at the trajectory that we've, we've set out here. Uh, the minister did say that in the, 20, I think, 21, 22, we, the deficit will stabilize a bit. And, and I think that given that we're going towards elections, given that we're out of the Zuma area, given that the President Ramaphosa is there, we need to have some space. As Kas Kuvadia, he's the Managing Director of the Banking Association of South Africa, giving his thoughts. Also joining us to give us her thoughts is uh, Tashmia Isma. She's the CEO of the Youth Employment Services. Yes, campaign. Welcome. Thank you for having me. What did you make of Tito? You know, what do you do? There's uh, a certain amount of money every year. You allocate it. What I would prefer is if Tito called for an implementation of Budget Day. Uh, and huh? we look at Say again? an implementation of Budget Day. Okay. Wouldn't that be lovely? Because we have the money. Uh -huh. um, I think it's an implementation issue in ah. each of these departments. So what would be fantastic is if budget was determined by performance. Right and performance in the ministries in these departments. Um, and perhaps we keep the budget as it is for a few years and on those targets see how we do. So, you know, in terms of the youth employment service and youth employment, uh, when the economy is tight like this, it is difficult to prepare a budget. We don't really have or see in the budget um, elements that are going to impact us greatly, yeah. Yeah. but it's a general economic malaise um, that is impacting youth employment. Did you see policies that's going to make your work a little easier? Well, if you look at the, the budget on university education, uh, you know, putting some money in there, yeah. uh, helping more people to get skilled and pulled into work. We the know biggest chunk of the budget still goes to education. Absolutely, absolutely. Higher education, I'm talking about specifically. So mm. it's wonderful that there's more money to create more grads. Uh, we know we have an economy that hires uh, very skilled people. We have an economy that grows not with jobs, uh, it grows with algorithms and automation these days. Um, and so we are looking for skilled people in the economy. Yeah. I think welcoming skilled people from abroad into the economy is also very powerful yeah. because it unlocks a lot of jobs in value chains if you can fill those, p those particular positions. Sure. So yes, there are things that, in that are encouraging, um, but we need the power on. So money towards ESCOM uh, is helpful because companies are not going to take on youth if they don't have power yeah. um, to power those businesses. Um, so, you know, welcoming that, it would be great if we saw alternate sources so we're not so dependent sure. and, uh, and a lot more focus on that. What was missing? If you look at our 18 to 35 market, this youth market, 56% of whom enter the labor force with no matric certificate, I'm wondering where the budgets are yeah. for the 6.1 million youth who are unemployed, uh, those who aren't going into the university or tertiary system. Right. And I'm looking to see where are the allocations within particular ministries for, yeah. those, uh, for those young people. Um, and it is siloed. So there is money there in certain places, but it's sitting in different pockets. Um, and what we would be looking for was a priority around employment, a joint fund so that it's not attacked from multiple angles uh, but with a pool. Absolutely. Krista, can I come to you? Sure. Um, <coughs> you earlier declared that you thought this budget was for business. And you also suggested that it wasn't pro-worker. But this is a budget. So in terms of the allocation of resources, the minister's hands to an extent are tied. Did you see anything in the budget that suggests that the minister actually knows there's an election coming and he should be trying to look out for workers' interests? You know, I, I'm always amazed when you, the general public, when they listen to something like a budget, yes, <coughs> they tend to favour business. I don't know if you if you've ever picked it up. Most uh -huh. people, <laughs> most people have aspirations to be rich one day. <laughs> so for some reason, most most people, especially in South Africa, have this view that is pro-business and pro-capitalist. 
Whereas actually they don't realize that they are the ones who should be waiting for those worker friendly policies to come. Yeah. Most of us, as we sit here, yeah. are workers, most of us. So it's I always find it interesting. So what happened, and I want to repeat what I said earlier, the issue we have with the budget is our budget, and uh, my colleague spoke about education, yeah. it doesn't help to give more money for education, but the education system design is wrong. Yeah. You can throw money at it as much as you like. Yeah. We believe, as we said earlier, the structure of our economy is still extractive. Yeah. It's overly focused on commodities, yeah. export of raw commodities. We need to focus on beneficiation. Absolutely. Our education system yeah. doesn't teach our kids yeah. to beneficiate. Yeah. 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 It doesn't. So, so one of the things that struck me <coughs> was the fact that there was nothing or very little said about what most economists are talking about these days. The retraining, the reskilling of workers that will be required for the fourth industrial revolution. Exactly, exactly. That's also what we want to hear. It's always nice to speak of the fourth industrial revolution. Yes, because you guys, right now, you are on strike at uh, Mines owned by Sibanya, and you've been on strike for the past three months. Yes. And some people are saying, actually, you see, you are focusing on the past because those mines are going to shutter one day. Yes, no, we know that very well. You need to be talking well. about the future. We know that very well, and we do talk about the future. We, we know that very well. What we want to see is beneficiation. Because the moment we can move our core focus from extracting minerals yeah. to manufacturing beneficiation, yeah. it will also solve our problem. It will also solve the problem of the working class. Yeah. We are currently following where capital chooses to invest its money. Yeah. What can we do? We have to do that. You don't agree? No, no, I, 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 I do agree. I, I just saw your expression when you were <laughs> saying we're following where capital is putting its money. Yeah. I, I, I do agree, but I, I think you have to create the, the, the environment where, where companies are, are, are willing to invest and take Did that steps. budget create that environment in, in enough clarity for you to be able to say, I am going to sit here and commit extra capital into this economy? So the, the, the eternal optis, optimist in me says yes, uh, because I, I, I'm backing the people in, in key parts of the government that are controlling money. So the, in the Office of the Presidency, Public Enterprises, the Reserve Bank and, and, and Treasury. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think that, that's where the hard yards is, go, is going to be done in this budget. And, and I, I agree, you know, it's going to be about implementation. So we can talk about all of these other things. If we can't get these yeah. enterprises right, if we can't yeah. sort out the public sector wage bill, mm -hmm. it's just going to continually drain any more money for beneficiation, for technology, for education, for small businesses. The, yeah. the government has to fix its own house, and that in itself... I think we'll be able to spark greatly towards creating to, that environment. To, to all of the, the environment yeah. to fix everything else. Yeah. Mm. So you want to come in? Sure. I think the function of, well, the fact that they mentioned technology and some form of investment is going he to go He just into mentioned it. He just them. mentioned some it. Form of but it's, 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 it's a good thing that they're focusing on the fourth industrial revolution. And it talks to my colleague's point around beneficiation. And how does um, Isn't that a tired conversation, though? It's tired, but it's a, it's a conversation that we have to labor a bit on, is how much investment do we have to now start um, putting into the process of beneficiation? And how does technology enable that? How does technology, um, you know, does it create jobs? Does it reduce jobs? How does it impact South Africa? And then also policies around um, this investment in technology. I mean, some of the policies that we've looked at is around intellectual property and how South Africa's becoming very unattractive to international investors yeah. in terms of acquiring into, um, you know, South African intellectual property. Yeah. Um, how, um, well, they have to go through a very rigorous and very expensive exchange control process. A lot of countries like Mauritius, yeah. um, I think South Africa is one of the few countries that still have exchange control. Yeah. A lot of people are losing our IP to international, um, you know, you people are registering their business in places like Mauritius, like Kenya. Yeah. So there are a lot of reforms that have to surround what we're saying about beneficiation yeah. and talking futuristic and talking about technology investments. Would you go so far as to suggest that the minister missed an opportunity here to perhaps set the kind of agenda that you're talking about? A futuristic agenda, I agree, because as uh, we were preparing for this interview, we said, you know, every year we've been coming to these panels, it's yeah. a copy and paste. Yeah. It's all about implementation. You didn't get any sense of creativity? Nothing. Any sense 
experience of someone who's thinking and coming work, up with radical how solutions. How's it going to create jobs? We're not talking about that. We're laboring on the same components. And I agree with Tash when she says, let's have a conversation around yeah, how yeah. do we implement the budget? Yeah. Not what's going to I'm be I'm here, spent. I'm seeing nodding heads here. <laughs> mm. Total complete agreement, you missed an opportunity, you could have been more creative. It's dour, Tito, this is not mm. precise creative. He has a sense of humor. He has a sense <laughs> of humor. Yeah. Uh, when we talk about 4IR, whenever we hear these speeches, it's, yeah. it's this like ring fence, the 4IR budget. But yeah. you know, 4IR is integrated into everything you do and helps you to deliver and implement more cleverly. If we introduced 4IR into teaching curricula, yeah. uh, how do we deliver Actually, content? there's a school in Cape Town I saw the other day who are actually introducing it at, I can't remember what level, yeah. but it was very low. Well, YES is doing this, right? So YES is delivering what training content on oh. work readiness and soft skills via digital platforms. We're doing it at a fraction of the cost of face-to-face -face training, which you can't do on a scaled national level. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's so integrated in, in the way that you work and deliver, your, whether it's your beneficiation or your uh, delivery to the door in communities that are very marginalized. It even helps you, so 4IR even helps you prepare for 4IR. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it, it's very delivery mechanisms, opens opportunities for training that is very sophisticated yeah. that you couldn't do before. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But now it's available online. Yeah. Uh, we just gave Google Digital Skills to thousands of people in our database. Yeah. And we had thousands of people open and finish this course online. Sure. So, so the opportunities for 4IR are not to see it as a circumscribed ring-fenced fund, yeah. but to actually use it as part of your implementation model. Absolutely. Heshel, I'm surprised you have not talked about what one of, one of the issues that the minister spoke about around land expropriation and trying to get more people to own land and have their own title deeds to their farms. Do you see any kind of impact that like to, uh, that will have one on sort of silencing the conversation or sidelining it a little bit, the conversation around expropriation of land without compensation and the damage that it has done. And on the other hand, uh, inculcating this thinking that, you know, when I buy land, I own it instead of, as Julia suggests, the state own it and then parceling it out to whoever it likes. So I think there are a couple of things. So, you know, just generally on the, on the, on the property, physical property front, there, there were no changes to transfer duty, no changes to capital gains tax, no changes in the thresholds below which so good. there's no transfer duty. So probably good because if it was going to go in any direction, it was going to go up. Uh, so <laughs> probably positive. Yeah. Uh, the minister announced a, a housing subsidy, a pilot program, I think oh, just, I under, just under a, a billion rand, I think 980 or 950 million rand too little, too for, a, too for a housing subsidy for first time buyers. The details are, haven't been published yet, so I'm not sure how it's going to work. It's a pilot program, so it'll be interesting to see how that it's works. It's new money, it's good, right? But it's, it's new money, it, it's facilitating uh, uh, home ownership. I think was what was also mentioned in there in, in the budget speech was a, a couple of billion rand that was allocated to private public sector partnerships in agriculture, so which has been tried before. I think some successfully. There were some that were in recent publications that have been an absolute disaster. Yeah. So they're looking to to transfer agricultural land and make sure that there's a public public private sector partnership to make sure that. The land is 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 utilised yeah. and there's training there in terms of specific mention of full yeah, farming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I think I think once again, I, I, I think I think that the government is 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 pushing in, in different directions. Is it enough in any one direction? Yeah. No, pro probably not. Mm -hmm. um, the issue of land expropriation, or rather, I mean, the issue of land ownership is is so uh, uh, critical to the the social and economic and political fabric of our country yeah. it simply can't be ignored but I, I think that from what I saw in the budget the government is saying listen maybe we need to do a little bit more right. while at the same time trying to, to find mechanisms yeah. that we can transfer land ownership without scaring everyone away so this budget is not anti-property no it's not anti-property at all is it pro-property well, listen, before the budget, it, it was a 50-50 as to whether the outcome would have been property negative or positive. And at the moment, our market, the residential market, hinges on consumer confidence. Yeah. Uh, if you look at the consumer confidence surveys, people think things are going to get better, but they're not prepared to go out and buy televisions, cars, yeah. and property until they can sense that things are actually better. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, once again, I think consumers are going to feel the pinch with bracket creep. 
yeah. an increase in, in, in fuel. But if the government can start to implement and keep the lights on and can show that the public sector is shrinking and yeah. the ministers are not taking increases yeah. as they seem not to be, yes. and the executives, once again, that they're small steps, but they will build on itself. And, yeah. I, and I think if they can, we'll see an improvement in consumer confidence, yeah. and that will start to, to, to move the, the residential market forward. Yeah. Tashmir, from your perspective, we know yeah. there's a crisis in youth unemployment in this country. There's no question about it. Mm. I can't remember the figures around the number of our youth that come into this economy looking for employment every year, but it's over a million, mm -hmm. right? Uh, did you find anything in it that shows an awareness on the part of the minister that he's got this, we keep sort of talking about this time bomb, mm -hmm. but actually this is impending, isn't it? Well, we did see, we did see some increase in jobs fund um, funding. Um, other than that, a lot of the funding towards the, the number you're looking for is 6.1 million youth that are unemployed sure, thank and you. over 7 million youth that are not in employment, education or training. Uh, so the number, the number is massive. It's, uh, Did it's you say 7 million? 7 million that are what we call wow. meets. So that's over a third of our uh, youth population between 18 and 35. Um, and that spend is largely locked within different divisions. So I would argue that CEDA's uh, funding in small business uh, indirectly is all about youth employment because we know that okay. small businesses employ in their first five years sure. and then they stop employing. Um, so any small business funding can also be said to be uh, contributing towards employment. But it really is sitting in, in buckets mm -hmm. in, in different spins. Yeah, um. absolutely. Let's uh, go to Cape Town where my colleague Fifi Peters has caught up with the Deputy Minister of uh, Finance. Uh, Fifi? Yes, of course, Godfrey. I mean, he's kindly invited me into his office just to have a better understanding about, you know, the thought process that went into this budget and also the engagements that the fine or the, the National Treasury has had with the ratings agency. Deputy Minister, thank you so much for your time. Can you just invite us into your confidence about the, the, the thought process that went into this this? This, this budget and the balancing act that you had to do with what was in the best interest of business, the best interest of the economy, but also the best interest of the South African people. Fifi, we, we, we found ourselves under the leadership of the minister in a very difficult situation where most numbers are not right. Your debt to GDP out of order, budget deficit, primary balance, a wage bill, state of um, state of state owned enterprises, which a number of them are financing their operations from debt. And that, that's the kind of a situation. At the same time, there's a, there's 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 low unemployment there's low employment, there's poor growth, there's inequality, there's poverty. Can you imagine a combination of all problems at the same time? Now, the challenge the minister had uh, working with us along was to send a message that we understand this situation and we are making proposals that demonstrate that we understand what one can sustain this country in a manner that other stakeholders can commit to actually participate. Remember, government alone can never turn around this situation. But government has got a primary duty to create an environment where other stakeholders can participate. So to do so, you create an environment of a, f of a fiscal stance that undermine the runaway of interest rates. Because once interest go up, as you had, the cost of capital is high, and it, it affects the entire environment. Investments get affected, no growth of economy, no employment, and all those kind of things. So the minister had to make sure that he provides leadership that balances all those things that demonstrate that how do we how do we arrest the debt? How do we shake the wage bill? How do we create conditions where we can demonstrate in a long time that the SOE debt can also be reduced over time? All the measures therefore that have been made, but at the same time, take a certain amount of money, build the productive capacity of the country from the point of infrastructure and using all other institutional interventions that actually make sure that we're going to implement infrastructure 
now in a manner different from the time from the manner we've been doing in the past and deputy minister the minister did say that you had been as national treasury in conversation with the ratings agencies about this budget about the thinking of you know um, allocating certain monies to certain areas what was their response to this um having interacted with the rating agencies at the risk of being misunderstood, I found them to be a credible people. Uh, they don't take, they, they don't always get excited by the problems they find you in. They are always interested. Do you have credible idea how to get out of that situation? If you can demonstrate to them that you've got credible idea on how to get out of the situation, you are also credible. <laughs> Those are few kind of tests that the rating agencies do. And once they can, you, you can actually find yourself walking along with them in those areas, the immediate problem is not what affects them. The resolution of the problem based on the interventions that they respect which you make is what influences them. For instance, in our situation last year during the MTBS, they, was, they were so disappointed with our numbers. But the, 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 but the zeal and the posture the president demonstrated and in, in actually showing how he's taking the country out of this and the actions he executed made the rating agent to say, we are not ready to run away from this country. That's in a nutshell. That's how I, I picked their attitude. And just finally, Minister, one of the, the, the positive steps that have been taken is regarding ESCOM and trying to you know, keep those lights on. And I'll repeat this question to you that we had this conversation about a bit earlier about the PIC's role in ESCOM going forward. Could you please, for the purpose of our viewers who were not mm. in that room, tell us the role that the PIC is going to play in ESCOM's future? Mm. Listen, um, <coughs> PIC primarily works to the interest of the pension of the employees whose pension we are holding. But there are two key mandates for PIC. Commercial imperative to ensure that workers' money makes returns for them. Two, we contribute to an environment where their generations are going to live when the pensioners are no longer alive. And pensioners who are our clients who have always given us mandate have always supported us in that path as long as we implement it in a manner credible, in a, in a manner that is honest, in a manner that, is, that doesn't put their money at risk. Now, the collapse of ESCOM in South Africa has got a serious bearing for a number of factors in the commercial sector. A number of institutions that work with PIC through which PIC is making returns. If ESCOM doesn't function, they get affected. So it's not in the interest of PIC that ESCOM must die. So one, one of the things, as I was saying, uh, PIC is actually open-minded, is open to deal with, is the loan book of uh, ESCOM, not the credit book, the loan book of those who are owing ESCOM. Uh, PIC is, is, is open to talk about buying that, which can translate in more than 10 billions for ESCOM on the immediate uh, time. At the same time, ESCOM, PIC is discussing the issue of turning the equity into into the loan into the equity. And also PIC is also looking at what options are there if ESCOM is broken into transmission, uh, generation, and uh, going on the new trajectory of uh, the electricity market. Are there commercial opportunities which will benefit PIC at the same time, give PIC an opportunity to also contribute in the revival of ESCOM and also giving hope to the multitudes of this country? Right, I suppose we'll have to wait and see for those uh, next steps. But Deputy Minister, thanks so much for your time. That was Deputy Minister of Finance, uh, Mr. Mondli Gungubela. It's back to you guys in studio. Thank you. Thank you, Fifi. As you come in, our conversation is hotting up here because we're talking about what Tito has done and what potentially he didn't do that he could have done. Let me remind you again in the studio, I've got guests from labor, from the private sector, and we're talking about uh, what this budget potentially means. So we came up with some four, a few more areas that we need to talk about. I was going to throw around scattergun approach and ask who wants to talk about ESCOM, but I think we all want to talk about ESCOM. Uh, can I start with you, Krista? You tell me from your side, 
how you see the approach that the minister has taken on Eskom and whether it will lead to the revival that is required to keep the lights on? We don't think so at all. We think Eskom has been gradually and systematically hijacking our nation. They have th in 2008, it's been proven that the load shedding was a stunt, was a way to get more money. We strongly believe the load shedding we've had now past a few weeks ago was the same thing. It's a way to convince... What are you saying? Are you saying someone deliberately went and tripped yes, the lights? Yes, we are saying so. <laughs> we say that the, the lights are being deliberately tripped for in order By to who? convince the general public, to convince the general public that they need more money. By Eskom, who? point By number who? one. By who? Yeah. <laughs> By the government? By the guys with their hands in the pockets? Okay. Yes. I wish I had time because I would have wanted some <laughs> evidence. But go on, finish your argument. No, well, evidence is, is not. Is evidence was there for 2008. You remember how we felt then? <laughs> you remember everybody was so confused. Yeah. It was horrific. Okay. And then it comes out a decade later that it was all staged. Sure. Completely. So what's the chance of it just being staged again? I don't know. I want to write but a book about it. But I want to speak it. about, I don't want to, to stop on the conspiracy theory. <laughs> I want to talk about the state. Yes, okay. State-owned enterprises. Yes. People in South Africa are becoming more and more scared of the state and yes. state interference. We believe the state has a very important role as a social partner. Remember, we have three social partners. Labor, yes. the state, yes. the old way, and, l and, and, and capital, the capital or the business. Employers, yeah. Yes. Now, if the state doesn't play a proper, strong role and have strong institutions, you will have a very bad economy. We believe in South Africa, business is too powerful because the state has been co-opted into business. And therefore, you have a lot of labor unrest, for instance, because of that co-opted nature. If the state is strong and state institutions are strong, yeah. we have a high social wage, which means consumer confidence, or what we would like to say, a working class that is making progress. So did you see in this budget anything that suggests that you will be able to get to that stage where the state is strong and able to bring everybody together? We, we hope so. We see, uh, prior to the interview, we spoke in the, in the room, and we said we have good leaders. We yep. have good leaders, mm -hmm. and we must give them recognition. Okay, I need to get the voices of the others in. State yeah. um, as an enabler for small businesses, yeah. I think it's very important to understand that they also have a role. Um, it's an ecosystem, it's not just the entrepreneurs and the Enabled small businesses. Enabled by ESCOM as well. Well, ESCOM, of course, if we don't have lights on, people cannot do their, their, their business. Yeah. Reducing the amount of red tape, it's very difficult, it's very costly for businesses to do compliance costs. It's very, very, dif uh, you know, very difficult for small businesses. Yeah. Collaboration with private sector, I think there's a lot of, um, it's a missed opportunity for skills that exist in the private sector yeah. to work with um, you know the government in ensuring that there is efficiency yeah. um, and then in terms of some reforms in some of the policies some of them are very relevant so I think the state has a critical role to play yeah. as an enabler for small businesses and yeah. the more we empower nurture small businesses the more yeah. taxes we can collect I'm hearing you speaking about enabling I'm not hearing you about this other government program the black industrialization program you know the people, uh, the question people ask is, can you create capitalists? Can you create too far uh, for these the normal uh, small entrepreneurs? Business. It, yeah. They're too far-fetched. I think what's relevant for small businesses is procurement. Yeah. Yeah. How do we ensure that businesses do contribute towards supply and enterprise development? And how does the government enforce that? Because a lot of the big companies and it was are not, not necessarily serious about really empowering small businesses. Yeah. They always have many reasons why they're not going to work with them or enable them in their supply chains. Okay. Um, and then also the procurement or court that 30% needs to be uh, spent on small businesses in, in, in procurement processes. Yeah. It doesn't exist. Well, if it does exist, it's still too small. It We've been mean. talking about yeah. this for more than five years. I mean, I'll add to Matsi's point coming in at a slightly different angle. There's a lot to be said for the mom and pop store. Uh, you know, they're the heroes of developed economies. Mm -hmm. If you look at Europe as a whole, you find that only 1% of businesses are actually over 250 people. Um, you know, nine, over 90% of businesses are actually one to eight p uh, people and they make the biggest contribution to GDP. And one they to make, eight people. Yes, and they make the biggest contribution to GDP and, and employment. And you did say 90%. Yes, over that. Mm -hmm. It's over 90%. Are you saying we need to break up Shoprite, break up Barclays, break up 
I don't know that it's about Simone. breaking up. <laughs> I don't think it's about breaking up the incumbents. Mm. I think it's about empowering the smaller businesses, mm. exactly as Matsi said. And you know, empowerment is not just around enterprise and supplier development. Yeah. Empowering small businesses is keeping the lights on, is giving them the infrastructure to be able to operate a business. Uh, you know, we, we have a hub in a township in Tembisa. We have a hydroponics farm there. We sold 900 head of lettuce from the community, from the township outside. This is how we want money to move. We want money to move from outside to inside the township and in yeah. that local economy. Yeah. Then we had a power cut for three days and we lost a crop. Stop. So, you know, th we, we, with all of our resources, couldn't keep that crop going. You, wa you wonder about the little businesses that Matsi's talking about, and those are the employers that mm -hmm. we need. Mm -hmm. But they need the infrastructure and the service delivery to be able to, to thrive and not live at that subsistence level, but really no. get into surplus and, and contribute to the economy. So in the budget, what would be great um, is, yes, sorting out ESCOM, but also showing real direction to innovation in thinking about alternate means to deliver services to businesses in these communities yeah. uh, that don't have the infrastructure that the, the incumbents have. Asha? So, so I, I, I agree, I, I think that you know, relying on government to, to, to provide you with anything, I think government should be there to provide you with safety in your homes and in your businesses, with education that skills you, with, with health care that allows you to work and to, and to, to function in the, in the economy. But I, I think, you know, even... even the classical neoliberal approach. Yeah, the, 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 the concept of creating artificial structures where, where, where government procurement is the engine for, for the development of small businesses, opens itself up to abuse. Mm -hmm. It hasn't worked. And I, and I think, once again, if you could provide incentives for businesses to buy 900 letters, hydroponic letters, heads, in some manner or form w with regard to a tax break, that's the way to do it. If you, for example, gave businesses with some checks and balances so that it doesn't go to bottom line profit, the opportunity yeah. to take skills development levies yeah. and employ people as opposed to putting it into services CETA where half of it goes into administration and you get nothing back for nothing put in, mm. I think that's, that's, that's where the money should be going. Government has a, 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 a limited role and uh, I firmly believe that the way to, to improve education, employment, the, the, the economic uh, transfer of economic benefit to the workers yeah. is, is through a growing and thriving economy and not a growing inefficient government. Absolutely. One quick point to all of you. Did you uh, do a good job? I'll take it. You did a good job. As the French would say, come see, come see. Come see, come see. No, he did No, he did not. Anti-worker? Anti-worker, not, anti not progressive, reactor. <laughs> <laughs> yes? I think he did yes, what he compare. had to do. I don't know that there's huge room to manoeuvre. Yeah, stuck in I, an I think this was an ESCOM budget and everything yeah. else was a sideshow. And it's important <laughs> that ESCOM gets fixed because otherwise if ESCOM goes down, the lights are going down. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming through and sharing your insights with us.